Brian K. Vaughn is a proven hitmaker whose name virtually guarantees big sales and critical acclaim. From the breakthrough masterpiece Why the Last Man to his early work at Marvel, Vaughn honed his storytelling skills until he became one of the industry's true superstars. Now he's in the midst of a career-defining work, the high-flying, sexually charged space romance saga alongside co-creator Fiona Staples. It's the biggest hit to come from Image Comics since The Walking Dead. The creative team hit the pause button on the series with a cliffhanger in issue 54, leading fans chomping at the bit for more saga. Let's try to get some answers when we go behind the panel with Brian K. Vaughn. By the time you launched Saga, you'd already had a number of successes under your belt. How important was that to give you the kind of confidence to put together such a batshit crazy book like Saga? <laughs> this is a book that reeks of creator confidence. Well, a lot of it was born out of the fact that I'd sort of taken a break from comics to work and film and television and just my frustrations of what I couldn't do in those two mediums. I love the spectacle of a big budget summer blockbuster, but I also like the sort of, you know, stakes of a good cable drama. And it's really hard to do both of those things mashed together, but comics is great at that kind of stuff. Yeah, Saga was supposed to be my version of everything that I couldn't do in film and television, everything that's great about comics. I don't think I was ready to tell it until I, I reached that point. It was on display in the very first issue with the birth of Hazel, the daughter of Alana and Marco, the lovers at the center of this intergalactic romance. That unconventional introduction was the springboard for a story that has been at times expansive, wildly inventive, and deeply personal. An ongoing civil war between alien races is the backdrop for a story about family ties, cliffhanger endings, sex, humor, and incredibly unique characters. I wanted to write about the terror and excitement and thrill of being a new parent, but if you have ever tried to talk about uh, what it's like to have kids with other people, they usually start yawning immediately. It is very boring to hear stories about other people's kids. So I thought if I could smuggle in all of my own anxiety and excitement about it inside of this sci-fi fantasy framework that I would be able to convey how it feels to be a parent, even to people who don't have kids or don't ever want to have them. Some dads get inspired to work out more, to build a treehouse. Vaughn was motivated to write a sci-fi romance adventure in the grand tradition of Star Wars, with a sprinkling of Lord of the Rings and a dash or two of Shakespeare. When it started, Fiona was like, I I'm happily child free, so I don't know if I'm gonna be able to contribute too much to this. I was like, that's not true at all. I, I want this book to be about how it feels to create anything, whether that's children or a novel or a film, just the uh, perils of trying to make new things in a world that doesn't always seem to want new things. So yeah, she's been so helpful. I think about grounding this story and making it really relatable to anyone, whether or not you have children. Talk about the creative relationship between you and Fiona and how what you put down on the page uh, influences what she draws and vice versa. Because I know you've talked about giving your artists a wide berth when they work with you. But I, I think it's more, I just listen to what the artists want. Just like asking them, what do you love to draw? What do you hate to draw? And Fiona was like, I really hate to draw uh, technology and machinery. And it's like, oh shit, this is gonna be this science fiction book. How do you do a rocket ship and without technology? And it was sort of after that, they were like, oh, well, you know, this is a fantasy book too. It's whatever we imagine. And so the whole sort of idea of a, a rocket ship that's a, a giant wooden tree came from Fiona. And when artists are drawing things, they're excited about. The results are so clear on the page. The unique creative trust required between a comics writer and artist is a major reason for Saga's success. Stables' incredible visuals and character designs help the title stand apart from just about every other comic out in the stands. She's not just the artist, she is the co-author of this book. Goose, the little uh, seal guy in overalls, just started out as a doodle that Fiona sent me and said, could a guy like this fit into the Saga universe? And I was like, not only can he fit into it, he is suddenly a vital part of this series. So yeah, really an equal pairing of the two of us uh, and our ideas. Lion Cat is another example of that creator synergy at work. Vaughn had no idea a pet character with a one-word vocabulary would become perhaps the breakout star of the series until he saw Staples' rendition. 
I have to say, I never imagined that Lion Cat would take on this life of her own. It is a testament to Fiona Staples, and I think just the idea to give this bald bounty hunter a hairless cat. Her design is so beautiful, and just her expression every time she says line is just slightly different and perfect for that scene. It wasn't until I saw Fiona's drawing that I was like, oh, this, this dumb cat is going to be the breakout character of this book. Vaughn jokes that Staples drew a line in the sand over the cliffhanger finished to issue 10, when it appeared the feline had been killed. I sent Fiona that script and she was like, nope, not going to draw this. She's like, I'll put a little spacesuit on this kitty and she'll be safe out there. But she's like, I'll, I'll quit the book before we do anything terrible to this character. So I think Lion Cat's going to be around for the long haul. A.B. Take a look at Vaughn's astounding track record and you start to detect a pattern. Why the Last Man with Pia Guerra, Runaways with Adrian Alfona, Ex Machina with Tony Harris, Paper Girls with Cliff Chang, Saga with Fiona Staples. The guy's secret weapon may be his gift for picking the right artistic partner for a creative team up. With Fiona, I'd seen some of her artwork. I just got the sense that there was something really special here. And I'm always looking for artists where you can't see their influences, that they just seem to be wholly original. And that was definitely Fiona in a nutshell. And then I think it's, yeah, we just called up and sort of chatted about, you know, what are your favorite movies? And she's like, I like 2001 and uh, Starship Troopers. And I was like, okay, this is all, I like this. We're in the same sort of wheelhouse of our interest of sort of subversive, weird science fiction. Years ago, Vaughn made the leap many comics writers dream of and went to work in film and television. A lot of guys in your shoes would have abandoned comics and stayed in television given the success you've had, but it seems like you're always drawn back to comics. Yeah, I mean, I love film and television. I love getting to work with actors. I love getting to work with musicians, which are things you can't do in comics. But I guess my time working there made me appreciate all the things that comics can do that these other mediums can't. Watching film or TV is a pretty passive experience. You can just sit on your couch and let it wash over you. But comics, you are the final collaborator that it's not just Fiona and me, it's the reader who is deciding what Lion Cat sounds like, is deciding what is happening in between these panels. And because they're more active in it, I think it sucks them into the stories in a way that movies and, and TV can't. So yeah, I just, I, I love what makes comics special. Vaughn's track record of getting his comics adapted for TV is stellar. Runaways just wrapped a three season run on Hulu. Paper Girls is being turned into an Amazon Prime series. Then there's the long gestating series, Why the Last Man, an adaptation of Why has been in the works for years at FX. Vaughn says he is happy to step back and let someone else take their shot. The beginning of my career was sort of very protective of Why, and I thought, you know, I I've written film and TV scripts, I should be the one to adapt it. But over the years, I I've sort of learned to let go, and that the comic, especially when I finished the last issue with Pia, I just thought, this is exactly the story I wanted to tell. I wouldn't change a word of it, and I don't want to do it all over again. I'd rather hand it over to someone else to see what they loved about it and take it to places that Pia and I couldn't imagine. How different do you think that story would turn out now if you would write it now as opposed to back then? Because the world has changed so much since that book launched. I, I think it would be an entirely different book, not just because how our ideas about gen gender have changed and feminism, but it, it's very much the comic as a product of its time. I wanted to write about what I was living through, and I was living in New York during 9-11, and it's very much a sort of post-9-11 post look at the world. So I think that the TV show is going to be radically different because it's a different medium first and foremost, but I think it should be as much about, you know, 2020 as why was about 2002. So I think it will still be very much capture the heart of the book and uh, the characters, but it's definitely going to be a, a, a new experience. He seems much more protective of Saga. Despite having a big money production deal with Legendary Entertainment, he insists he's in no rush to see the comic turned into a movie or TV property never thought of it as like, here's my unsold spec script, or this is when I want to get turned into a movie. I'd be very happy if Saga's never a TV show, never a movie. It's just a comic book. I'm not against adaptations, but I, I just wanted to have one thing to sort of protect and be like, this is what's great about comics. And if you want to read this story, you can't wait for the movie. You have to come to our little medium and give it a try. Saga's bold take on ethnicity, sexuality, and the impact of war set it apart from other comics. It has also helped attract a massive and diverse fan base.
You know, it means so much to have people come up and say, I see myself in this book, because I, I thought, you know, originally this is going to be such a, a cult sort of niche weird book, but the fact that it has become so universal, just a lot of credit again to Fiona Staples. Instead of having a book where just everyone is a familiar white face, like I think in a lot of science fiction fantasy, white characters are sort of the default. And I think it was Fiona's idea from the very beginning to say, if we're going to do this story about blended families and cultures colliding, this can't look like every other sci-fi fantasy story out there. It should look more like the real world. And people come up and say thank you for that, that you recognize how much it means for them to see themselves represented. Saga's 54th issue marked the halfway point of the story Vaughn and Staples have been telling. But it came out in July of 2018, and there's still no official return date for the series. So when it comes back is anyone's guess, but the duo promise they are working on it. Fiona and I are hard at work. We just sort of want to bank enough issues that we'll be able to do what we did the first time around. We just put out all of these issues exactly on time and we never missed a shipping date. So I know people are, are <laughs> frustrated, but we appreciate your patience and uh, it's coming is all I can say. Vaughn says he knows exactly how the story will end, but he says getting there will yield plenty of surprises for the creators as well as the fans. Saga starts with a, a really detailed roadmap, and I always know the sort of major signposts that this character is going to die here, and a new character is going to be introduced here. I'm not one of those guys who likes to make it up as you go along. I've always known the final panel of the final page of Saga, what it's going to be in. So I've trusted my wife with it. I told her, because Fiona doesn't want to know. She likes to be surprised as it goes along so she can sort of channel her surprise and energy into the page. So it's all in my wife's head. If I get hit by a bus, hopefully she'll be able to pass along to Fiona how to wrap this story up nice. Next time you're at the comic shop, pick up a copy of Pride of Baghdad. It's a graphic novel Vaughn did with artist Nico Enricon. It's one of the best standalone stories in Vertigo history, and that's really saying something. We hope you enjoyed my conversation with Brian K. Vaughn and be sure to tap that subscribe button for more great comic book content. And don't forget to check out my weekly column at SciFiWire.com. And of course, keep listening to the Behind the Panel podcast. It features great stories and insight about your favorite comic book creators. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, Lion Cat forever.